Hi, I'm Jackie L. Jones Esquire. What is your point of view? Tell me what's your point of view. What's your point of view? What's your point of view? Give us your view. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in. We are here and we're going to have a great interview today with my sister, Jackie Jones. Jackie, tell the people a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm Jackie Jones. I have a law practice in media, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. I'm also a life strategist. I'm a school board member. I'm a mom. I'm very active in my sorority and do a lot of community service. So apparently I don't sleep a lot. Not a lot of sleep. <laughs> Listen, we just really got her just by the, you know, grace of God that she was available this weekend because she is always on go, but it's always go for good reasons. So today I actually was looking at your video clips and talking about the mental health and the court cases. And I really didn't know they had separate court cases for things like that, which really makes sense because they're not all on the same level. Talk to us about the different court systems. Well, there has been a strategy and an attempt in many jurisdictions around the country to break out certain courts. So we started with a drug court, specifically for people who had uh, drug problems who were in recovery or needed to be in recovery, trying to recover. We expanded it to a mental health court and a veterans court. Mm -hmm. So those are things that are going on very actively here in Delaware County and around the country they have those type of courts, other specialty courts. I think what happened was I have been involved in a lot of cases recently in mental health court and I think the best way to put it is I've not been pleased. Mm. I've not been pleased, I've not been happy, I've not been enjoying the process as much as, as you can enjoy criminal court, which is hard to enjoy. But I've not been enjoying the process because I don't think it has been working in a way that has been helpful to people who really need the help. And mm -hmm. so I've been on a quest to find a better way to do it um, while trying not to get myself arrested <laughs> um, because I am a little bit bold in the no, way I speak to the court. <laughs> borderline disrespectful. Borderline. <laughs> wow. So... Um, before we get back into the, the court situation, let's talk about mental health in general. Yes. About kids going undiagnosed and some things yeah. that we can look out for to kind of see, you know, and trigger say, hmm, maybe this child may need to get tested or checked or something. Well, I think that it has been helping that we are talking more about mental health and we're talking more about mental disease, disorders, defects, all these names they have for them, but basically differences, sometimes in learning style and thought processes. Mm -hmm. um, every difference is not a problem. Sometimes a matter of, you know, we need a little therapy to help us to think and conform. But I'm not a huge fan of conformity anyway, so that's not a problem for me. But what I found in the school system, because I have been a school solicitor and I have done expulsion hearings and now I am a school board member, is that there are times where there are students especially who are having difficulty in school. And it's not because they can't do it educationally. It's because they can't think their way through the process because something else is going on with them. Uh, so what I say is if a child is acting out a lot, instead of sending them to, let's, you know, let's call the police on them or let's send them to the office or su suspend them, the first thing we want to do is say, is there something going on with this child? Are they having a problem? Is that problem a mental health problem? Is it a family problem? Are they experiencing suffering? Are they being abused? If children are acting out all of a sudden especially, mm -hmm. something's going on. And I've, I've heard, uh, I guess, really lately, a lot of people talk about trauma. The oh, kids yeah. are being traumatized by their neighborhood and environment, so they may not actually have a mental illness, but they may be a, their trauma in their life. Then they need trauma-informed care. Um, it's something that, you know, in our juvenile court system, Judge Nichols, who's a, you know, a great guy who I was involved in helping him get elected, he has been very involved in looking at trauma-informed care for children who are adjudicated or potentially adjudicated. Because you have to understand, if you are experiencing things that are awful, um, murder, death, abuse, 
um, severe poverty. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to have food when I get home, like some of these kids are. It's hard to go into a situation and what? Everyone wants you to be happy. Go, let's all sing the wheels on the bus go round and round. And the teacher's like, Johnny doesn't participate. And Johnny doesn't seem happy. And Johnny wants to punch the wall while we're doing that. Because Johnny doesn't care about the wheels on the bus. Johnny knows he won't have food when he gets home. Johnny knows his father is incarcerated and he won't see him again for a long time. Johnny doesn't understand why his mom cannot be there for him. And so a lot of times the trauma that children experience is much worse than the, some of the things that we experienced as children. You know, some of us, the worst we had to think about was, my mom won't let me have two after school snacks. I can't have a cookie. I can't have a cookie, <laughs> but I wanted the cookie. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, it's, it's just that we have to be realistic about what children are able to deal with. Uh, and, and we need to be a little more sensitive to the fact that life is not easy um, for everyone. Especially in certain neighborhoods when there's a shooting. Yeah. And then th that child witnesses that or that was a friend of them theirs or a friend of the family. And they come to school the next day and then the next thing you know they're in detention. Well, it's hard. I mean, my children lost their father when they were very young. They were two and three. And we spent a lot of time doing therapies. Um, I have, you know, we've had mobile therapy, behavior therapy, family therapy, specialists, psychologists, psychiatrists. I have gone through the gamut because it's a traumatic thing. And it's an ongoing traumatic thing that impacts you in different ways at different times. They also have the benefit, however, of having an attorney as a mother. So if something goes on in school and someone says, well, I'm going to suspend her, you know, I show up and say, well, you know. As a political scientist, and because my PhD work when I was studying it was on juvenile justice and race. So I remember one time my daughter was, you know, she was really going through a trauma, and they were talking about suspending her, and I had enough. So I went up to the meeting and I said, listen, I'm going to speak to you first as, you know, as a political scientist, a lawyer, and as a mother. So as a political scientist, I understand whose work has been on juvenile justice and race that there is a coincidence of juvenile suspensions leading to juvenile justice, which ultimately leads to adult criminal incarceration. You better break it down, as girl. As an attorney, <laughs> I have seen children who end up in juvenile court more often end up in an adult court. And as a mom, what we're not going to do is we're not going to stigmatize my child. So here are a list of things that I've done and some research I've done, other things that you can do instead of suspending her to deal with this infraction. Drop the bike. <laughs> but, you know, I had someone come to me as a parent who was desperate shortly after that, whose daughter had done pretty much the same thing, and this child is out of school. You know, and so I realized that the advantage of knowing your rights and not accepting any behavior puts my children at an advantage over other children. This and this is something that I hope that they're being more aware of. Because if it's a public shooting, then they say, okay, we, we have the right. staff on, That's right. on notice. That's right. But if it's not a public shooting, because I know, for example, yes. personally, when my mom passed away, my mom and my youngest son are very close. Mm -hmm. And he started acting out in school. I knew. Right. And then when I went and talked to the teacher, she's like, okay, we might have to send him home. And I went and talked to him. I said, well. You know, his, he was very close with his grandma, and his grandma just passed. She's like, I did not know. At that point, right. she began to handle the situation differently. Absolutely. So sometimes we have to make them aware. But this, you know, after a couple of days of him acting out, then she finally said something, you know, sent a note home and said, eh, he's really been acting out. And I went and talked to her. I said, well, he just, his grandma just passed. She's like, enough right. said. Right. But that's not always the case. It's not. And it's also because you look at um, school shootings, for instance. You see Sandy Hook or you see these other horrible things that have happened. And the first thing you hear is there are counselors there. They will be talking to the children and their families. What happens, though, is that if you have ongoing trauma in your neighborhood, there are no counselors there on an ongoing basis. We understand what the crime rate is and you know, in a lot of these urban centers especially. There are no ongoing therapists whose job it is to just check in and say, hey, are you okay? I saw that someone got murdered in your neighborhood last night. Did you know them? Was it your brother's best friend? Did you walk by and see a, the police action or a body? Things that you can't imagine the children have seen. We don't look into that. And of course, there are other issues that are not just trauma-based. They are actual chemical imbalances. And those often, as I mentioned earlier on the Five Minute Live, those often start when children are in that 17 to 18-year-old age and, and up through about 22. So when the diagnoses first happen, um, in fact, I had one recently. He was diagnosed at 17 um, with a form of schizophrenia. 
he turned 18 within six months and no longer wanted to take medicine. Mm. Now imagine what that's like <laughs> as wow. a parent when you know your child needs help and they're still in that age where you need them to be med compliant because if they're med compliant in that age range between about 17 and 22, they're more likely to stay med compliant throughout life. If they can't get it together when they're young, you are going to see this again and again. I see people who are in their 40s and 50s who say, well, I took the medicine. I don't like the way it makes me feel, and I stop. Mm -hmm. But I'll take it again. Well, you'll take it again to get out of jail, but how long will you stay out of jail mm -hmm. um, if, you can't, if you can't get it together and you can't stay compliant with your medication? Mm -hmm. Mental illness is a very serious situation. So we're here just talking about giving some information, some tips. As you can see, she is very knowledgeable of with everything that she already does. She has had multiple experiences and cases that she's fighting for. But guess what? We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back and talk about those court cases. All right. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, hey, everyone. It's your girl, Portia P. from Sisters. Catch me Sundays 3 to 5, only on cmpradio.net. Sisters, we talk a little bit about everything. We have gospel for you, gospel news. We talk about our won't he do it segment and our girl talk. So make sure you tune in. That's right. Sundays 3 to 5, only on cmpradio.net. It's time to hear from you. Welcome to Hey, welcome back. We are here in the Vision Video Production Studio with Jackie Jones. And we're going to talk about those court cases. So let's first, you know, give a little tip about mental illness and then talk about the actual going to court and having to defend people with these conditions. Great. Um, I guess my first tip would be get a diagnosis if you don't feel right. Uh, sometimes it could be as simple as your physical health. But whatever it is, just find out. It's just worth it to find out. Yeah, mental health is very serious, and you don't want to have to end up with court and then find out that you're in jail getting diagnosed, but right. now you already got your sentence. Well, not only that, you're in jail getting diagnosed, and the process is a mess. So let's talk about some cases, and I'll tell you why the process is a mess. Uh, I think back a few years ago, I had a young man, he's very young, and he had shot someone. And is an older woman. He'd gone into her home, he'd shot her. Uh, prior to that, it's sort of what happened was an uh, older gentleman had tried to um, basically molest him, it tried to have a sexual encounter with him that he didn't want. But as I got into the case and he got into the house, he thought he was at his own mother's house when he walked in there. But what I found out during the case was not only was he suffering from mental illness, he had been um, traumatized in a lot of ways. His parents were both drug addicts. They had a number of children, ranging in age. He was one of the younger ones. And each child had been taken away from them. He had been adopted. You think it was a happy story. He had been adopted by a wonderful woman. And he came home one from school one day, and she was dead. Um, so there he is back in the system. And his parents obviously are not resources. They are gone. His brothers and sisters, some are grown, and they're trying to help. But they were young themselves. And he found himself in a group home. And of course, by then, he had been diagnosed with his mental illness, but he didn't want to take the medicine. Mm. <laughs> he didn't like the way it made him felt. And let's be clear, a lot of times, you don't like the way the medicine feels at first, because you go from the high highs that you've been and to this steady affect. And no one feels normal with that. They, I don't feel like myself. Well, yourself was way at 100 all the time, and no one can sustain that. Or yourself was way at 1 or 2 a lot, and no one can sustain that. So the medication, I mean, he didn't take. And he had been living on the streets for about a week before this incident happened. I remember meeting with him, and I remember his preliminary hearing, which is actually right over here in Chester District Court. And at the end of the hearing, he's, and he was tall for his age. He was about, you know, 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, so he was tall but young. And I remember afterwards, he started to cry. Like he was just starting to feel like, realize what was going on. And um, <laughs> the sheriffs all backed away. They were like, I don't want to deal with this big crying boy. And so I remember putting my arms around him. And, you know, I'm so much shorter. I'm 5'4", and I'm trying to wrap my arms around him. And I'm patting him by the back, and I'm walking him back into the holding cell. And the sheriffs just let me do it. Like, no handcuffs, no, you know, just go ahead and take care of this baby. And, and I remember thinking, like, what are we going to do here? Like, there was nothing. There was nothing. Um, I remember we got to the next level, the Court of Common Pleas, 
And um, I met with him before that. And I went to the prison. I met with him. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, you're my lawyer now. I said, yeah. And he said, well, I had another lawyer before. And I said, really? And he pulls out a note from me. And he said, yeah, it was Jackie Jones. And I said, sweetie, that's me. I'm the same lady from before. That's me. He had been taking medication now, so he was starting to get clearer. He didn't even know I was the same person. That's how much of a difference had been going on with him. But as we were making the plea, there was nothing that I could do that I thought was good. I didn't want to put him into Norristown because he goes into a public treatment facility. He could be there for who knows how long. Um, I had an option where he was going to have to go to jail, but that was really the only way that ensured that he would take his medication. And that's when I first learned that if you can get the medication compliant before they hit about 22, 23 years old, you're more likely to have someone to stay medication compliant. So it was not a good situation. I talked to his older brother, who is now a nurse, and I remember he felt so upset and ashamed that he couldn't help his brother. And he said, I just, I tried, it, I just, you know, I just got out of school. And I, and I said, it was nothing you could do. There was nothing he could do. He had gotten out of school himself. He had parented himself. And he was trying to get his family back that had all been lost through someone else's drug history and drug abuse. And it was so sad. And so you fast forward now, maybe eight to ten years later, and we do have a mental health court now. Mm -hmm. And that goal of the mental health court is to help people who have mental health issues or cognitive issues where they're not going to be able to stay in trial. Wow. That is a lot. I don't want to, to go into, when, do you, when you decide to take a case, what are some of the things that you decide, what are your deciding factors, a few of them? Well, it's hard because in a lot of times these cases, uh, you know, I have one now that's a, a private case where I was like, he needs help and no one's going to, a lot of times I don't think people um, treat these children like their children. I like to look at this and go, what would I want done if this were my family? So if I see that there's going to be a difficulty, if I know another lawyer will just make a plea and won't look and do the hard decisions, then I stay involved. Uh, there's also times that where the court appoints us as attorneys, and I find the court is appointing me to more and more of those lately. But uh, in those cases, the court appoints us because a lot of these people are very vulnerable. They don't have any money, they don't have any support system, and they need uh, representation. So in those cases, I don't have a lot of choice. <laughs> but what I find is that I look to see, is there something that can be done? Because a lot of times what happens is lawyers were part of the process. So with all that you've seen, what are some suggestions you can give to somebody to where they can go and get help? Well, I think that um, insurance obviously is such a big deal because if you don't have insurance, a lot of people cannot get the help that they need. So you want to make sure that if someone is in need of mental health treatment, that you do what you can to sign them up for either Medicaid or to get them private insurance if they're, if they're capable, but you want to make sure that they continually stay insured. Um, I think the other thing is that if you have the coincidence of mental health issues and mental health court, meaning a criminal case, uh, that you have to not only look at the mental problem, you also have to look at what the underlying criminal offense is. Mm -hmm. Is this an offense that is related to my mental health issues? Uh, is this something where I could be in mental health court for the next two years, but really, if I pled guilty to it, I would have 30 days of probation? So those are things you want to look at. You know, if someone is found with a small amount of marijuana, for instance, it's 30 days probation. But you could be in mental health court. You could sit for months while the judge says, we need to get an evaluation for you. Uh, that's why it's helpful if you see someone spiraling out of control to have the evaluation first. I had a case recently where I was able to say, listen, he has a diagnosis. He's being treated in this institution. He has these doctors, and they are willing to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And when you can do that, the judge is willing to let him out on bail because here are all the treatments that are already in place where you don't have to wait for the county to pay for you to have a diagnosis. Gotcha. This is the proof. This is the situation. Let's move based yes. on what we know. Right. Okay. All right. So... As you can see, she is very knowledgeable. If someone wanted to get in contact with you, how would they do that? Well, I'm always reachable. Uh, obviously, we have all the social media for Jones & Associates. It's Jones & Associates Law PC. Um, everything is sort of backslash J-O-N-E-S-A-S-S-O-C. -S -S so we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. <laughs> Uh, personally, I am at Jones World Order on all those platforms. I think we're on Pinterest. We're on Pinterest, too. I like Pinterest. <laughs> okay. So easy to find, easy to look up via Google. 
can hit our office up at 610-874-1900, 874-1900. But remember, we don't just deal with mental health problems. We do a lot of other things, so it's always worth talking to us and exploring that. All right. Thank you, sis, for coming and hanging out with us today. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for keeping me out of trouble. I had some things I wanted to say about some people. <laughs> Listen, so she won't need no bail money this time. But I keep my bail money in the Capital One 360 account. <laughs> and I mean that from my heart because, as I've told them, I don't work for you. I work for my clients. And I'm looking directly at the camera because I want the judge and the DAs to know I don't work for you. So if I need my bail money, I'm willing to do it because we're going to keep doing the right thing. Hey, and that's what counts. The right thing <laughs> counts. So thank y'all for tuning in. Check out my girl. She's very knowledgeable, very aware about those situations and more. But thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Thank you. Yo, good brothers and sisters. I'm your host, good brother Mark from the Good Brother Talk with my brother from a different mother. Good brother E. Our show is all about spreading positivity, having fun, talking about those real topics, getting down and dirty with it, but also do it with a purpose. And if you have any topics that you would like to discuss, feel free to come on in, get in touch with good brother Marvin, myself, or call the show, or come on in, we'll love you, have you on the show. You can reach us on Facebook on our Good Brother page, Good Brother Talk. You can check us out on our Instagram page, Good Brother Talk, also cmpradio.net. If you have a phone, because you don't do social network, you can hit us up on the Live 365 app. You can tune in to us every Sunday from 12 to 2. Every Sunday from 12 to 2. Come on and join your brothers. Until then, continue to spread the positivity. Peace. Tell me what's your point of view. What's your point of view? What's your point of view? It is your view. Point of view. Point of view. What's your point of view? It's time to hear.